Oh, um, well, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> and are you nervous? A little bit. I got the butterflies, so, yeah. Um, definitely more nervous than Larry for Justice. Uh, he did come to our class earlier today, though, so we did have more of a conversation with him. And he's great. He is? Engaging and asking me all kinds of I mean, he's really friendly, very humble. <laughs> My question is about um, Barry job history. He's working on Santo, the Department of Education, Legal Aid. And I want to know what, what are the advantages and of this and whether or not he has any advice for undergrads preparing to enter the job market. Uh, I'm asking him a question about law school. I'm uh, kind of asking him what are you doing. Beauchamp. Father Beauchamp has been a Holy Cross priest since 1982. He holds a Master's of Business Administration and Juris Doctor in addition to his Master's of Divinity. Father Beauchamp taught with distinction at Alma College in his native Michigan and at the University of Notre Dame, which is in South Bend, Indiana where he also served as executive vice president before joining us here at the University of Portland. He came here in 2002, and we have called him Father President since 2004. In his tenure here, University of Portland has topped the nation in student and faculty Fulbright awards, in numbers of hours of community service, has nearly tripled the number of students who study abroad, has celebrated two national championships in women's soccer, and has added new land and buildings and upgraded facilities in every direction on campus. I should also point out Father Beauchamp's unique connection to today's events the very first Red Mass ever celebrated in the United States occurred in 1877 at the Church of Saints Peter and Paul in Father Beauchamp's hometown, Detroit, Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in joining to the podium the President of the University of Portland, Father E. William Beauchamp of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Thank you, Karen. And now I would like to invite to the stage the two University of Portland professors of political science who will jointly moderate this public conversation with our distinguished guests. And now let, allow me to introduce them to you. First, Dr. William Curtis. He grew up in Missoula, Montana. He attended Dartmouth College where he received an AB in government. He received a Juris Doctor from the University of California Hastings College of Law and practiced corporate and real estate law in Denver for a year before clerking for Justice Rebecca Love Corliss of the Colorado Supreme Court. Dr. Curtis then pursued his passion for political philosophy, earning an MA in philosophy from Stanford University and his PhD in political science from Duke. He taught at the universities of Alabama and Vermont en route to his current position, which is here as a recently tenured associate professor of political science. Dr. Curtis is also a captain of the Oregon Army National Guard, serving in the JAG program as a trial defense services judge advocate. Dr. Curtis. Dr. Gary Lee Maleka was born and raised in rural Minnesota. He attended the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and graduated magna cum laude with a BA in political science. He received a PhD in political science from the University of Notre Dame. And prior to arriving at the University of Portland, Dr. Maleka taught at the University of Northern Iowa, California Polytech State University, 
Trinity College, and Weber State University. He has been at the University of Portland for 21 years, serves as the chair of the political science department, and teaches a wide range of courses in American politics and American political thought. Dr. Maleka is most recently the co-author of the book, The Public Congress, Congressional Deliberation in a New Media Age, published by Rutledge Press in 2012. Dr. Maleka. And now on behalf of the University of Portland, I am pleased to welcome Clarence Thomas, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and also his wife of 26 years, Virginia Lamp Thomas. Justice Thomas was born in 1948 and raised by his grandparents in the Pinpoint area near Savannah, Georgia. Pursuing a potential vocation to the priesthood, he attended Conception, Missouri in, uh, Conception Seminary in Missouri eventually completing his undergraduate studies, cum laude, in English, at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. His studies at Holy Cross included 1968, which as we know was a year of profound changes in the United States. The events of that year, especially the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., moved Justice Thomas to become active in several social causes, including campaigns for civil rights, during those years in Massachusetts. He earned his Juris Doctor at Yale University in 1974 and was admitted, was admitted to the bar in Missouri that year, commencing on a distinguished and varied legal career, first as Assistant Attorney General of Missouri, then moving on to serve as an attorney for the Monsanto Company. The call to public service drew him to work as a legislative assistant to Senator John Danforth, from there, he headed in 1981 to Washington, D.C., where he served as the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in the United States Department of Education, as Chairman of the United States Equal Opportunity Commission from 1982 to 1990. He became a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in 1990. And when Justice Thurgood Marshall retired in 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated him as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and he took a seat there on October 23, 1991. You heard how often I use the words serve and serving in these introductory remarks. That is truly the disposition that Justice Thomas has always brought to his legal work on both sides of the bench. On the way to this point in his distinguished career, he found time to write a best-selling book entitled My Grandfather's Son, a memoir, which illuminated for readers the wellsprings of his pursuit of excellence and public service. Please join me in welcoming the, to the University of Portland, Justice Clarence Thomas of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you. Should I say something good again? Yeah. Justice Thomas, uh, again, I want to uh, extend our uh, gratitude for you being here with us at the University of Portland today. I want to start off with a few biographical questions. Uh, Justice Thomas, you've written a lot about the formative influence that your grandfather and the nuns at St. Benedict had on you growing up in the South in the 1950s and the 1960s. What kinds of lessons did you learn from them, and how did those lessons shape you as you took yourself to the court? Well, um, first of all, let me thank you all for being here. Um, I know you all have better things to do. <laughs> so I have no idea how they uh, required you to all be here this afternoon. <laughs> I uh, don't rare, I don't frequently get to the West Coast, but if you'd spare me a minute and I'll get to your question. Um, some years ago, um, Father Beauchamp did something, a favor for me, uh, to help someone that I cared deeply about. And I promised him then that one day I would come to the University of Portland. Uh, it probably caused him more trouble than he wanted. <laughs> But um, the, 
I have this special place in my heart for people who keep their word, and he kept his word. Um, my good friend, Judge Scanlon, also um, is very much connected to the University of Portland. And so it is a, not just an honor to be here, it's an honor to be with people who made it a point to keep their world, word. Um, the journey in my own life has been a journey that includes many instances in which people don't do what they promise to do. And people don't earn trust. In fact, they abuse trust. So it's always unique and special to be around people who do what you expect them to do and who earn your trust. So if you want to look at just the primary reason for being here, it started with that. It has its seeds in trust. Now your point. The people you're talking about, you know, I read these narratives about the South and they all have us crawling through dirt and when we're not crawling, we're running from the Klan. Um, I lived a wonderful life with the people who raised me and in an environment that was positive, reinforcing, and directed us in a very special way. So the values that I have, the approach that I have had, reflect the way I was raised. A couple of weeks ago, I went to New Jersey to the retirement home of the missionary sisters of the Immaculate, Con missionary Franciscan sisters of the Immaculate Conception. They were the nuns who came from Ireland to help black kids in the South. My eighth grade teacher was celebrating her 100th birthday, um, Sister Mary Virgilius. She had been a nun for over eight decades. And I often think about them because they were the ones who insisted that we were equal, inherently equal. So when I hear people talk about natural law, the whole premise of neutralizing segregation in our minds and the effects of it was something we heard every day from our nuns. You are inherently equal. You were created equal by God. That was the lifeline. It was reinforced when you read Frederick Douglass, when you read Lincoln, when you read the Declaration of Independence. But first place we heard it on a, on a regular basis was from the Irish nuns from our grandparents. So there is so much that came from that neighborhood, that environment. St. Benedict the Moor was my school. And um, so my point is simple, that the roots and the seeds of much of what you see reflected even to this day started with those good people. Justice, how did you make your way from uh, the seminary on to Holy Cross and then ultimately law school. What prompted you to follow that route? Oh, I was going to answer the first part of your question and tell you trailway, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I know you were being a lot more serious than that. <laughs> it's amazing what you see on a trailway bus. <laughs> but um, the, um, I don't know. I, I would just, you know, I'm, Perhaps it, people would think it's um, not appropriate, but I think it is, that it was truly by the grace of God. Um, in 1968, those of you who were, came of age remember, it was not a good summer. Dr. King was assassinated in the spring, and that was the end of my vocation. Um, and then I went home that summer and of course, my grandfather immediately booted me out of the house for quitting the seminary. I was 19. And then later that summer, uh, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, was assassinated. So, and I vividly remember my reaction to that. It was in that environment that the wonderful priests, Father Brooks and others at Holy Cross, accepted me. So I had no place to go but to Holy Cross. And so I can't tell you I had some plan. I had no plan. I was, um, and, and so that I'd say it was by grace. And Father Holy Cross turned out to be perfect for me. Um, 
It was a wonderful school at the time. Father Brooks was a great man. He's since passed away, but uh, it was good for me. You certainly had a wide range of experiences uh, working in the state government, working uh, for the legislative branch, working for the executive branch before you came to the court. And so you knew a lot about politics. You've had that kind of experience. And I'm wondering, uh, when you made it to the court, was there something that surprised you about the court, something you didn't anticipate when you first got into the chamber? Oh, there was a lot of work. <laughs> God dang. <laughs> my first reaction is, what have I gotten myself into this time? It's like, oh my goodness, or be careful what you ask for. But it's, um, I think on a serious note, I was surprised by how warm a place it was. I don't know how many judges you know, but I've gotten to meet quite a few federal judges. And I found that most of the judges, almost to a person, are quite capable and they take their work very seriously. Uh, at the court, it is a, I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's an insular world. Uh, that's what's fascinating when people write books. I have no idea what they're writing about because it's a very insular world and it's very private um, or at least it's uh, distant from the rest of Washington. What, when I met Justice Marshall, for example, I was shocked at how warm he was to me or Chief Justice Berger or Justice Powell. They were all very helpful. Justice Byron White. Um, so I was used to Washington where it was rough and tumble and people were saying things. And I had just come through a, uh, a confirmation hearing that was not pleasant. And so this was uh, quite a change. Um, so I would first say it was warm, the people were engaged, uh, they were hardworking, it was very focused. And most of all, it was, um, it was almost like a seminary. It was, had, it was a contemplative environment where there wasn't a lot of background noise. You could actually think about things. You could actually talk about things. You could actually reason through and analyze problems. So that was surprising. But I must also say, although I was only on the Court of Appeals for 15 months before I was nominated to the Supreme Court, that was my reaction to the Court of Appeals that judges were just, I loved working that way, um, both because of what it demanded of you and because of the environment and the colleagues. So I would say the, the fact that it was so positive was a surprise and much different from Washington, the Washington that you hear about. Um, Your Honor, I'd, I'd also like to extend our deep thanks uh, for you to come out here. It's quite a privilege for us to have you here. And I'm also really glad that the UCA Bruins didn't, after last weekend's win over your beloved Cornhuskers, didn't put you off of the West Coast. <laughs> what, did something, did you go to UCLA? No. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I figured that the, the red mass is an I thought athlete. You, I thought you went to Hastings. I did go to Hastings. <laughs> our, our football team would lose to the, to the Cornhuskers. Um, <laughs> But I mean, at least the red mass is an aptly named mass for us to pray for the Cornhuskers to have yeah, more well, success. Yeah. Oh, well, no comment. <laughs> um, as, as someone coming from a Catholic education, I, I know that you appreciate um, our, our emphasis here at the University of Portland on developing not only the intellects of our students, but also their moral character. And you, you know, our motto is uh, head, hands, and heart. And you've written and spoken a lot about the uh, influences on your moral development, including your grandparents and the nuns of St. Benedict. But I actually was wondering if you could t tell us about um, influences on your intellectual development, especially as an adult. Are there any books or people who you felt really influenced you? Oh, I think you are influenced at different phases. I'm not saying that all of them are good influences. I mean. I was influenced by Kid Colt and Two Gun Kid and comic books. Um, but intellectually, I'd, I'd have to say, I mentioned my nuns because I think that was the foundation. 
And I have to mention the ladies at the Carnegie Library in Savannah who taught me what you could get from quietly reading and thinking about things. I mean, I can't tell you how many times they said to me these important words, shh. <laughs> <laughs> and so you learn to quiet yourself down and read things. Um, and they also brought me books when we were on the farm and taught me the love of that and the, the desire to have books and things to think about. Now, specifically beyond the obvious things that you learn from, I started reading Ayn Rand in high school. Now, why would a black kid from Georgia who's 16 years old read Ayn Rand? I have no idea. There's no explanation. Um, but I started with Fountainhead and uh, Atlas Shrugged and, Shrugged and um, um, Virtue of Selfishness and some of the other Ayn Rand books. And I started as perhaps many young blacks of my era, I got very heavy. I read Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison, and I think that all of those influenced us, and it also expressed some things. The anger, the confusion, the identity issues that you have in Invisible Man, and trying to work through those things. But I started reading those things as a teenager. But you also read in the seminary the other things. You read Thomas Aquinas, you read, uh, you reflected, you meditated, and later in life, I read other things. I was very fortunate to go to Holy Cross, which gave us a traditional liberal arts education. You were steeped in philosophy. You read uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Kant, and uh, you worked through the nihilists and the existentialists. You took metaphysics and ethics, none of which I liked. But <laughs> <laughs> you, and you took the literature courses. You took history. And I think in the end, you began to sort it, through, sort it all out. You began to think through, why am I taking um, Middle English literature or readings in Renaissance prose? And then you figure it out one day. You read through the hard things. Later on, I would come across other writers. And I'd just give you a sample. People like uh, Professor Tom Sowell, who uh, had been through uh, been a Marxist and had worked his way through and became more of a free market economist. Um, and whom I had rejected out of hand when I was in my youth. Uh, and I ran, came across people like Paul Johnson. Um, and you began to try to think through uh, periods, whether it was world wars or relativism, or uh, whether or not you were looking back at the Civil War, world history. You know, so you might read Shelby Foote or uh, someone just to work through these things. And, but I can't tell you that one specific person, other than perhaps Tom Sowell, had a huge impact on me. Uh, they all were very, very helpful in helping me to think through my own ideas. You, you once referred to yourself as a part-time political theorist, which made me happy, because now you're, you're one of us. But that was the 1980s. I'm on to other you're, things uh, you're, now. You're past that now? <laughs> I've moved on now. Well. <laughs> I still, I still have to ask you. Oh God, I entertain myself. <laughs> All right, next question. No, I, I'm, uh, I have to ask you a, a, a political philosophy question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell our students that we live in a constitutional liberal democracy and that there's a tension between the latter two terms. Uh, democracy, of course, implying at its most basic majority rule, liberalism implying inviolate individual rights that can't be violated even, if, even by a majority vote. And so I think a lot of times on the court, you have to balance these things, democratically passed laws versus individual rights. How do you, how do you negotiate that, that tension? Um, you know, I... I think, first of all, I think it's fascinating. I looked at the word, look at the word liberal. Gosh, how that has changed, how we've misused that term. But certainly, I think it's worth defining as you use it, and you have done that. Um, you know, I think our Constitution was an effort to balance that. And if you go back and you look at the early cases, uh, like Mar uh, Marbury versus Madison or McCulloch versus Maryland, they're all still balanced. I mean, they were all trying to do that. And think about all the loose ends that the framers left, because they couldn't resolve it. 
And much, if you, at bottom, many of the battles that we have, the five, four opinions, are still trying to sort out where that balance is. That's what's so, I think it's so troublesome when people look at cases and they look at their interests in the case and all they can see is what they want and don't see at bottom. And I think that's the beauty of, of the class you had me join you in uh, today. It's an opportunity to see that it's more than this specific issue. It's that balance again. So, so in Marbury versus Madison, it wasn't just about the getting the commission. It was about how do you, who makes the decision? Okay, then you have in, in McCulloch versus Maryland, it isn't just about the first national bank. It's who decides. You have the same thing with federalism. You have it with the First Amendment. You have it with the Fourth Amendment. You have it with Kelo, you were mentioning today, with property rights, the taking. Who gets to do these things? Uh, the individual against the state, the national government versus the state government. All these balances that you're talking about. But uh, the framework is set out in the Constitution, but even the framers didn't resolve it. Now, when we approach it, the first thing you approach it with is precedent. And we get it in, we get it in a more structured and contained environment. You already have like dormant commerce clause cases. You already have commerce clause cases. You've already got the, we were talking today about cats and the expectation of privacy in the Fourth Amendment. So you already have mechanism for deciding the case. You already have precedent and criteria for deciding the case. So it's not free, re, free roaming or freewheeling. It's not just an expedition that you can make it up. You're constrained by what's gone before. Now, you may reject that because it doesn't make sense, but you're already constrained and informed by it. So you start with what you have. You start with the precedent and the frameworks that, that are available. If the, if the framers and the founders disagreed themselves about some of these uh, questions, how, how, do you, how does one take an originalist approach to the Constitution, um, you know, which attempts to, what, find some sort of consensus meaning, maybe, of the, of the Constitution? Well, I think that you start, for example, if you were uh, making a decision about a contract, what do you start with? You start with the contract, so you're originalist. You start, you start with the language, and then you're trying to work back to figure out what the intent is, even though the parties might disagree. So it makes sense to start with what you have. Um, the, I, I always think it's fascinating um, uh, when people say, well, you should just, you know, it's nothing like the framers wouldn't have known, but you have a written constitution, this is new. You've got to start with what's written. Otherwise, the whole endeavor is illegitimate. Um, do you get it perfectly? Get it uh, perfect? No. Does it always work? Not well sometimes. But you're dealing with a human institution. So you're always going to have some degree of imperfection. But as far as legitimacy, I think you have to start with the document. And then you go back and you're trying to figure out what is the intent of the people who wrote the document? What did they mean by these words? What were the practices at this time? For example, do you realize, let's say you're talking about the Establishment Clause, right? Do you realize there was such a thing as establishment churches? I mean, it just, that's, you don't just make it up and say it is separation of church and state. That's one letter to Thomas Jefferson to the Baptist Convention, which was sort of one of the protesters uh, in, in New England. So you, you're looking at what they meant by those words. I was in Trinidad and Tobago some years ago and a, someone in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the audience asked, why is it we use contemporaneous dictionaries when we're uh, interpreting old documents or the Constitution? And I said, well, let's just take a simple word. Um, if in the, in the 18th century you say there was a gay event in the park, what would that mean? Happy event. Okay, if you say today there's a gay event in the park, what does it mean? The, the meanings of words change, and you have to look at, in order to discern what they were talking about, you have to define it in a way that's consistent with uh, their language and their use of language. And similarly with the language in the Constitution. Um, what role do you say that, would you say that the Declaration of Independence should play when you go about interpreting the Constitution? You've written about this before, and there are big, vague terms in the Declaration of Independence, too, like all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. uh, does, that, does that help 
when you come to the Constitution to try to interpret it, or, or how, what role does that play? I don't think you, you know, I don't often use it. I think that you see the Declaration as a backdrop. It's a precursor to the Constitution, but the actual operative document is the Constitution itself and the amendment. I think it gives you a context in which to view the Constitution. If, if the Founding Fathers were to come back today and look at the government that we have, I want to ask you to speculate a bit. Uh, and if they saw what it is that we have today, what do you think their response would be? Would they be surprised, pleased? Bleak. And if you could ask them any question, what would you ask them? Well, I think most of what they say would be bleeped out. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, as one of my colleagues told me, they wouldn't recognize what's happened. And the, anti the so-called anti-federalists would say, we told you so. We told you that the national government was going to take it over, was going to take, become powerful, and we told you that the unelected judges would become too powerful. The very dangers we pointed out have happened. So I don't think they would recognize it. I don't think that any of them, the good and the bad, I think that this, this country has been enormously prosperous. Um, the, whenever you go, you know, we were just in Europe, um, and we have our problems, but this country has really prospered. And um, so I think that would be a surprise to them. And, but I think they would, as far as the arrangement, I think the anti-federalists might get the best of the argument, that uh, many of the fears that they saw have come to pass. If you had a chance to meet three justices or two or three justices from American history and sit down and have dinner with them, any two or three justices, who would you like to have dinner with and why would you invite them to dinner? Oh, I would have them invite me, but... Um, <laughs> The, um, I'm pretty cheap, so. <laughs> now, I'm, seriously, I think I would like First Justice Harlan because of Plessy versus Ferguson. I just think that's an exquisite dissent. Um, I would probably like to spend a little bit more time with someone I actually sat with, that's Byron White. Uh, I think I did not spend enough time with him, and I'd like to get to know him a little better. Um, I did meet, did sit and talk with Justice Marshall, so I, um, probably Chief Justice Marshall. I'd like to talk to him about what he thought, particularly in those early cases, how they made those decisions, why he did what he did. And he actually defended himself um, in some of the criticism after the, the Maryland case, McCulloch versus Maryland. He wrote op-eds under a pseudonym. But um, I'd like to talk to him. Um, uh, beyond that, I think I'd let them go to rest in peace. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things you learn in this business is you give it your best shot when you're called upon to decide cases. Uh, the only people I know of who seem anxious to want to go and decide more cases are people who never decided cases. Uh, this job has a, an amazing way of humbling you. Uh, when you sit there, you realize just how small you are in the universe of things. When you're sitting in your office alone, trying to make a decision, having worked through all the briefs and talked to your law clerks, and as Chief Justice Rehnquist would always say at conference, you must vote. You don't get to him and haw and talk it to death, you must decide. You ask any judge, any judge, then he or she will tell you, I've got enough. Um, so I wouldn't reach back to want to do anything that they have done, and I don't think they would want to reach forward to deal with anything I have to deal with. Justice Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, when I first went to the court, I sat with him in his chambers, and it was supposed to last 10 minutes, just a courtesy visit. But it lasted two and a half hours. And in the process, I said to him that I thought that 
perhaps if I were <clears throat> not old enough, I would have liked to uh, spend time with him as he traveled across the South, changing things and arguing cases. And he looked at me and he said, I had to do in my time what I had to do. You have to do in your time what you have to do. In other words, your mission is your mission. It's youth specific. And I don't think any judge would reach out to try to do another judge's job. It is really humbling to do it. And look at us. I mean, we're gray if we have hair. It's just I mean, what's there is thinning. And you do what you have to do. And it's, it is not easy. Again, I repeat, the only people for whom the job is easy are people who've never done it. The rest of us, it's really hard. And we don't want to do anybody else's share. <laughs> uh, Justice Thomas, what area of constitutional law do you think is the most problematic or has the most problems right now? Oh, I have no idea. Um, whatever's on my platter this term, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I, you know, I, everything's changing. If you look, for example, at last term, we had two cases in DNA. One a Fourth Amendment case and the other one intellectual property. That's coming down the pike. And all the other issues, legal, ethical, constitutional, they're all coming with it. Um, I don't know what's going to pop up next. I have no idea. And I really, uh, the, I can generally specul speculate, but I don't think that that's worthwhile. Uh, do you think things are getting tougher? Do you think society is getting more complex? No? Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't have any evidence to base that on. I think it's certainly with the information age and with technology, technology, things are speeding up. I don't know if we have more information. I know we have a lot of things masquerading as information out here. But uh, I have no idea whether we have more or less. But the, the, I'm sure the framers thought that things were getting complicated. I'm sure after the telephone was invented, people thought things were getting complicated. After the automobile was doing 15 miles an hour, people thought things were complicated. So, you know, I, I think we absorb change and we deal with change, and I think we've been quite sufficiently capable of dealing with it over the last 200 plus years, and I think we'll continue. But um, I think we should, that's, that's the beauty of being at a university. I just think it is a chance. I wish I could go back to, to, to college because I would go much more seriously than I went. And I was pretty serious. I think I just wasted too much time. Um, the, it is what a wonderful time to think about all these things. The, you have an opportunity, you have the time, you have the luxury of thinking about all these things now and preparing for and anticipating what is coming. For us, we're in a reactive mode. We grant certs. We decide what's coming to the court. It is there. It comes in the form of a case and co or controversy. We have to decide what comes through the door. So we don't, unlike the university where you can say, let's take a seminar on this or that and think about this or that, we actually only do what shows up. It would be you who would be bringing it. Uh, so I think here you can begin to prepare for and think about those things, what's coming down the pike. I think we'll have some of our students ask you some questions. Justice Thomas, that's okay. No, it's not on. Uh, is there's, no, there's no button on there? No. You want to? Just, you, wanna, you, wanna, you can go. You go in a minute. Raise one of your questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Justice Thomas, what do you enjoy most about being on the court? And what is, <laughs> what, what do you find most troubling? Um, I think I like being with young people. Uh, that's probably the, um, the best part. I like my law clerks. You can ask any judge, and virtually every judge will tell you he or she loves their law clerks. Um, it gives you an opportunity to stay connected. It gives you an opportunity to talk about things anew and afresh. 
Um, the other thing I like is I like to be around young people who are really trying. Not the people who know it all. I mean, that, well, that's a glass that's full of nonsense. But um, the, I like young people. Like I was in a class this morning um, with um, Professor Curtis, and I thought that was really interesting. I thought the kids were energetic. They were thoughtful. They were thinking about things. And I like to visit with them at school, uh, at, at the court. Uh, just to talk with them and answer their questions. I also like to deal with kids who come from the circumstances similar to my own. That's a tough, I don't think people realize how heroic young people are who overcome those challenges. Uh, it is not easy and they are young and confused and I like to be around them. They're so positive and I think that they're the ones I, who reflect the American dream. And I love to be, to help them and to help guide them as they make their, their decisions. They don't need you to carry them. They just simply need a part of your life to give them guidance. You wanna try this again? There, there you go, Joe. another shot here. <laughs> Hello? All right, there, there we go. go. All yeah. right. Okay. Man, I'll teach I, the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're around us. I don't know, right? <laughs> All right, Your Honor. My name is uh, Joe Shorman. I'm a uh, junior sociology major here at the University of Portland. And my question for you is, how do you choose your law clerks, and what role do they play in your chambers? Well, I'm pretty arbitrarily. Um, actually, that's not true. <laughs> To be, I, treat, I, I take law clerks from people I can trust, like Judge O'Scanlan, um, that they will train them, that they're good kids, that they're smart, and that they're intellectually honest. Um, he has to sort through them, uh, and, and, and he will be honest with me about whether or not the clerk is, can measure up. This is not, I have four law clerks, and I really am not Mr. Nice Guy. I want my stuff done, um, and I want it right, and I want it on time. I don't let the wine, the cat died, and the car <laughs> broke down. You do that on your own time. I want my stuff. <laughs> if you got, you got to crawl here, you know. You hand it in with your last breath. But um, <laughs> the, uh, no, I'm really serious. I'm sorry. I bet you are. No, I I'm bet really. You are. <laughs> so the and he can sort through those kids. But intellectual honesty is really important. I don't like jerks in my chambers, uh, smart Alex. I like people who get my stuff done. Um, now, beyond that, I like kids from modest backgrounds, kids whose parents had to make a choice between the rent and the braces, between the fixing the transmission and paying the tuition. I've been there, and I like kids from that. They're different. I like kids from non-Ivy League schools. Uh, not because I have anything against the Ivies, but because there's lots of smart kids all over the place. And our court is heavily Ivy. Every member of the court is from Harvard or Yale. Justice Ginsburg graduated from Columbia Law School. That is not, that's, that doesn't reflect the country. Uh, why aren't there kids from this school? Why aren't there kids from, or judges from Idaho? Why aren't there judges from uh, uh, Montana? This is a big country. So I like my clerks to be from a lot of different places and a lot of different backgrounds. And I also like kids who like sports, particularly my Huskers. Nobody, <laughs> nobody who's going to root for UCLA. <laughs> but you generally, you get it. I like regular kids who are smart and honest and hardworking. And go Aggies, by the way. <laughs> go Aggies. My name is Grace Powell and I'm a junior political science and Spanish major. And my question for you, Your Honor, is about your very job history. You've worked in the Department of Education and Monsanto and legal aid. And I was wondering as you look back over your career, what you would say are the advantages and disadvantages of this and whether you have any advice for undergrads who are preparing to enter into the job field. Oh, I was just lucky to have a job. <laughs> I'm just a like, I'm not, I was not, I could not be picky. I got a job out of law school, a. So I went with the job. And I can honestly say, in all the years, I've gone from, we used to call it busting suds, which is washing dishes. I've gone from that, I've done grass cutting, I've worked on roofing work, I've done 
uh, septic work. Long, I've done it virtually every job. And I've had never had a bad job. I have never had a job that didn't teach me something. Uh, now, the career jobs, I got the only job I got. It turned out to be a blessing. Uh, one of the funny things about the job, it wasn't that it was so bad in Jeff City, Missouri. I mean, a lot of people are running to Jeff City, Missouri. But the, it wasn't that it was so bad and it was only $11,000 a year, but I had to actually work for a Republican. That was a kiss of death. Why am I working for a Republican? So you can see how far left I was politically, that the idea of working for even a moderate Republican was repulsive. Um, the, but it, God knew better than I did, and it turned out to be a wonderful job and a great man. Every job I've had has come about through some good fortune. And my rule is very simple, and my advice to young people is simple. Don't get caught up in the glitter. When you have to choose between jobs, work for the person. Work for a person of character. A good person can make even a bad job good. A bad person can make a good job miserable. The other thing I would say is, if you're doing the job, do it well and don't complain. Um, you, give, you sour your own attitude when you do a job with a sour attitude and you sour people around you. I have been extremely fortunate. I have given every job I've had the best shot I have, even this job, and it's taught me habits. It also taught me this, this is my final point. When I was in low-level jobs, it taught me how I would treat those who worked with me. I vowed that I would treat them the way I wanted to be treated when I was at their point. Uh, even dealing with students, I made a decision that I would never treat students as though they are subjects that I would treat them the way I would have wanted to be treated when I was a student. And it has worked out well. But I would just encourage you not to look at the glitter of the job, but to look at the person who's doing it. If that's a good person, you'll be amazed at the good you can accomplish. And, and this is totally my final point. I think we here are given a choice. We're, we're given an opportunity to do well but I think we are given that opportunity to do well so that we'll be able to do good. Um, and you learn how to do good from people who already do good. And that's why I emphasize the character of the kids as well as the uh, employer. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Your Honor, my name is Eileen Canningeiser, and I'm a senior political science major here at the University of Portland. My question for you is, what is the greatest challenge you face in responding to today's issues while also remaining faithful to your originalist view of the Constitution? Oh, I don't think I, any of the challenges are all that great. I think it's your job to, there might be difficult, but I don't think there, I wouldn't put, I would not put them in the category of great. I think you all might face some very difficult challenges in the future. But I wouldn't say they're impossible at this point, or I wouldn't even say great. They're just challenging at times. How do you, with your originalist view of the Constitution, how do you respond to the issues of today? Do you think that the issues of today can be fit into the Constitution? Yeah, I don't know the specific issues, but I've, so far it has not been a problem. You know, I haven't had a problem. I just. The, uh, I wish I, if you had a specific, I will, I could address it, but I, I just really haven't had a problem. What about in, term, in terms of technology? Well, I mean, it's, for example, we did DNA last term, both in Fourth Amendment and intellectual property. We have done GPS. We uh, do all sorts of things involving uh, intellectual property and the uh, uh, computers, for example. So, I mean, I, uh, I would have to, we've done infrared in the Fourth Amendment. So, I mean, the, the so far is so good. I'll let you know when we run out of uh, ideas. <laughs> if you see an opinion that starts with, duh, yeah. no, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Cecilia Cervantes, and I'm a senior political science major. Um, and my question is, um, what are your thoughts on the election of judges, and more specifically, nonpartisan court commissions like the Missouri plan? I have no idea. <laughs> Look, I am just glad that I made it through our selection process. 
I, I really can't, I don't have infinite wisdom on that sort of thing. I think that there are pros and cons about each system. And I think that you should take, states should take it seriously, and you should understand if you don't have an independent and effective judiciary, you are going to have all sorts of problems in your legal system. You need judges to resolve these disputes and to interpret your laws, and you need capable judges. I don't think any system is perfect. Uh, elective systems has problems, and the appointive system has problems. My biggest problem has been with interest groups who can swarm any of these processes. Uh, the, if you go back and you look at even federal judges and you study the elect, when the nomination of Bob Bork and you look at what I think was a travesty. I know Bob Bork. You don't have to agree with him, but he was absolutely one of the most capable judges in this country. Uh, and, and to say that he wasn't qualified is nonsense. But the, um, the process began to deteriorate after that, even for federal judges. You, I think, I would assume you are 20, 21 years old. Uh, you should be concerned about that because your ability to have a civil society will depend in large part on whether or not you have a capable and independent judiciary. If groups have ways of determining that certain people can't be there because they don't like them for some illegitimate reason, that is going to be in great jeopardy. But you should go back sometime and take a look at the selection of Robert Bork and his confirmation. I think that was the beginning of it. Now you can do that either in the federal system where it's, it's appoint, the appointment is by the president or you can do it where there's an election. Either system can be swarmed. Thank you. Hi, Justice Thomas. My name is Emma England and I am a junior political science and economics major. Uh, my question is, with law school tuition rising and grim job prospects for law graduates, what advice would you give to undergraduate students, like myself, who are looking at law school, but who aren't sure if the benefits are going to outweigh the cost? Oh my goodness, I was never much at career planning. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, my, oh goodness. You know, I think it's, that is individual. Um, I, I, and this is a bias, the only difference I see between my law clerks who went to state schools, um, the ones who went to inex less expensive schools, and the ones who racked up $200,000 in law school debt or whatever it is, is the debt. The students learn at either school. That's an individual decision. Some people like big schools, some like small schools. Some are fine with cold weather schools, some like warm weather schools. You have to make your own mind up, but I think what's more important is what you do when you get there. Um, if you go, take care of your business. Don't go and be siphoned off for somebody else's issues. You are there for your own reasons. I, one of the things I tell young people is, before you go, you sit down privately and you write your reasons why you're going, you. And when times get difficult, you look at your own list. I had to do it so many times. There was, it is a, this road from Georgia to here was a long, hard road and it was enormously lonely. So there were lots of times you were left with just your dreams. And so you have to be clear with why you're doing it and how important it is, because it is a lot to take on. Final point I'd make is that I finished paying my student repaying my student loans my third term on the court. Oh yeah, I dragged that around, didn't I? <laughs> so <laughs> there's no way, that was my heirloom. Um, but I will say, even if I hadn't paid it off yet, it was worth it. How else was I going to get through law school? And I have no regrets about it. Um, people will drive a BMW and pay for that for six years, but don't want to take out student loans and pay for something that will last forever for the rest of their lives. So um, think about it, I, but it's personal, okay? So I've got, I've got a question for you. No Cornhusker jokes, uh, Justice Thomas. 
there are no jokes worth telling about the corn husk. <laughs> in the uh, in the spirit of the red mass, uh, one of the things I've, I've noticed about a, a lot of your engagement with the public, with students, is, is just how hopeful you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how your Catholicism plays into that sense of hopefulness. You know, think about it. What are your choices? I mean, think about it. I mean, in this environment, I, you know, I was, you get a bottle of water. You read the water. They tell you all the stuff that's in it. And they actually even tell you what will happen to the bottle. It won't ruin the environment. Okay, we're all concerned about what we consume. We're worried about what a, a piece of lettuce does to us or a piece of tomato or meat or fish. We, we're talking about what we ingest and how much. Think about, that's our bodies. Well, what about our minds? What about our spirits? Think of the things we're ingesting on a daily basis, cynicism, negativism, hatefulness, uh, negative attitudes. People d dismissing people who are good-hearted as naive or misguided. We hear it all day. We turn on the news. When you leave here, just go turn on TV, and you'll see it. This almost sneering at you. Don't you think it is worth at least saying to young people to ingest positive things? We say ingest positive things in food. What about positive attitudes? Um, there were, when I was coming through school, there was so much negative on race. I mean, it was a tough time. And I was looking for some positive things to provide hope, to keep me going in an otherwise dismal environment. And I think we have an obligation as those who've gotten through some of those challenges to tell younger people who are confronted by those that it's worth the effort, that it is worth trying, that in one way to do that is to have some glimmer of hope about these things. So I try in what I do not to poison them, not to feed them, just as I wouldn't feed them contaminated food, not to feed them contaminated ideas or contaminated attitudes. And, and it's hard sometimes, I have to be honest with you, because as a human being, everybody gets a little down. But I don't have a right to spread that to these kids. And I think that as professors, as adults, we should try to be as positive as we can because they're, got, they've, they're the ones who actuarially are gonna live much longer. And they're the ones who are going to have to confront these very complicated problems. So you will see a, a measure of hope on, in, everything, in virtually everything I do for those reasons. I'm gonna try to lighten things up here a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we've seen, and I noticed, when I was growing up, I don't think I ever s saw uh, Supreme Court justice on television or... Did you have a TV? Yeah, I, I did have a TV. <laughs> <laughs> I may have been slow in those days, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, the, the idea of having them write books and, and speak to groups of folks... Uh, yet today we see justices writing books, giving interviews, talking to people. Is there some change uh, going on here? Well, I think uh, if you look at it, I mean, how many, I mean, think, I bet you ev virtually everybody in this room has a cell phone. 20 years ago, virtually nobody had cell phones. Uh, and virtually everybody in this room probably has a computer, a TV, all these ways of communicating. So um, I think that the the, the idea that, uh, of communication, of footage on TV is quite different. That permeates virtually 100% of the society. So let's start at that end, the consumer end. The other thing is that I think most members of the court don't enjoy as much anonymity now, in part because virtually all the confirmations are controversial, and there's so much footage on the Internet and other places. So the... Maybe members of the court in the past did do those things, but it wasn't as widely disseminated. Uh, you saw them in law review articles, there were lectures at law schools and universities, but the dissemination, the dispersal of those ideas was not nearly as universal. So I think the difference might not be so much in the fact that they're writing and speaking, but in the fact that so many more people are hearing what they're writing and speaking. Would you be happy to see television cameras in the courtroom? No, not really. I mean, I don't care one way or the other. But here's what I think. 
you have to be concerned about it. Uh, I've already lost my anonymity. I already ha can't go any place without being recognized. Uh, I can't uh, and, and go places without people not knowing generally who I am. That's problematic for me because that's, that's the downside of the job. Um, so, but you have to ask yourself this question. Will it help us do our job? Uh, and I don't know how that would be the case. For example, I said to the students this morning, consider this, one of the most heavily covered cases since I've been on the court involved the probate exception to our jurisdiction. Now, who's interested in the probate exception to our jurisdiction of the court? Probably nobody or some misguided person is interested <laughs> in it. But you say, well, why, was, why were all those people there? They were there because it involved Anna Nicole Smith. So it was the tabloid effect that they were interested in. And what you're going to run, 95% of the information that we use to decide cases is already public. So what additional evidence or what additional information of involvement that you need would come from having cameras in the courtroom? And how will it, what effect will it have? Your trade-offs again. What effect will it have on our decision-making process? I don't think it would be a particularly good effect, and I don't think people will get much more relevant information about how we do our job, other than to say, I know Anna Nicole Smith was there. <laughs> last question. Last, okay. yeah. Boy, how, how academic do I want to go here? Um, a little bit. Um, you know, let's let's do this. Uh, we've talked about who, which uh, Supreme Court justices you might want to meet, Justice Thomas. What about presidents? I really don't get involved in politics, but <laughs> probably Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, there might be others, but off the top of my head, I'd say Lincoln. Uh, I've met all the living presidents and many of those, and some of those who passed away, but I would probably say Lincoln. I'm very fond of Lincoln. Um, beyond that, I, I, I can't think of anybody. There are other people I'd like to meet, like my grandparents. But anyway, let me, since this is the last question, let me thank you all. Um, the, I met with students this morning uh, in Professor Curtis's class. And I have to say, it was quite enjoyable. I always get something from being around students. They're positive, they're interested, they're energetic, and they're trying to learn. And hopefully, uh, in our exchange, they got something out of it. Similarly here, I hope that sometimes, if you come my way, but we didn't talk as much about the court, but it is an interesting institution, it's very private, and it's very cloistered, but it's your Supreme Court. It's yours to learn about, and I don't think you should be content with letting people feed you what they want you to know about it. It's like every other subject, math or science. You have to work to learn about it. And if you truly care about it, it's worth working to learn about it. It doesn't matter, it's up to you, how you con what you conclude from that, but it's worth the effort. So I would encourage you all, who are still in school in particular, that you use your time well. And just remember what I said, that if I were going to college, knowing what I know today, I would double down on what I did uh, in my years at Holy Cross and actually increase the amount of work I did. I think it's all that important. And for those of you who think the world is facing all sorts of problems, well, prepare yourself to confront those problems. The problems are going to come, and the only issue is whether you're prepared. And finally, let me just thank you all again for your hospitality, your courtesy, and it gives me a positive view of your university, the students who are here, and the professors and the administrators. So thank you very much.
so what comes next? If you are uh, participating in the Red Mass, I invite you to join us in the Chapel of Christ the Teacher, which is across the parking lot and diagonal, and it's the big chapel with the cross on top. That Mass will begin at 5.30. It remains for me to thank our audience for their um, engaged attention to thank our students for formulating and posing questions in a thoughtful way that makes us so proud to be part of your formation. Thank Professors Maleka and Curtis for moderating the, the conversation. And in a very special way to thank Justice Thomas for being a man who keeps his promises, who, uh, who would definitely get along with the Congregation of Holy Cross, one of whose mottos is they are men and women with hope to bring. So we thank you for the hope, we thank you for keeping your promise, and we thank you for the challenge um, to, to get us to stop and think deeply and be quiet sometimes and think deeply about those things that matter very much. Thank you, Justice Thomas. Okay, um, so what was, what, how was the overall experience? Oh, interviewing uh, the justice? Yeah, it was really, uh, if you think about it, it's somewhat overwhelming. You know, we don't get a chance to speak with someone like that quite often. But at the same time, it was kind of nice to get what it was like, to talk to him, uh, to get a sense of you know, his background, his experience, uh, to get a sense of, of him as an individual, something we don't oftentimes get a chance to see. And I think that was really informative and enlightening. And that it seems like a lot of the questions are more focused on his background than on judicial or political questions. Was that an intention? Well, I mean, focus? what we tried to do is we wanted to get a sense of, first of all, who he, who he is, what he's like, what kinds of things did indeed inform him. Uh, in terms of making decisions on the court, what kind of experiences shaped him in terms of making decisions on the court. So we wanted to get a sense of that. We also wanted to get a sense of, you know, just his general orientation in terms of approaching, you know, his position as uh, justice on the Supreme Court. So those are the things that we're really trying to get a handle on, you know, in talking to him. Were you surprised by Clarence the man, um, as opposed to Clarence the judge? Uh, you know, it, it you know really is somewhat uh, surprising when you get a chance to, to meet someone like that, especially someone who doesn't uh, really find himself today in the public eye with great frequency. Um, you know, and so you really learn a little bit more about the individual and I think a lot of folks who saw him were really surprised by what he was like, you know, the fact that he had a really good sense of humor, um, you know, and some of his own experiences, you know, in terms of growing up that were really important in terms of shaping him as an individual. How do you think that history will look back on Clarence the Judge? It's really too hard to say. I mean, that basically if you go and take a look at it. It takes a while for these things to sort themselves out. Um, you know, oftentimes we don't have a sense, you know, in the immediate time period in which we're living in, of what these judges, you know, what these justices um, are like, what their legacy will be. And it takes a while for us to get, you know, an idea in terms of how they contributed to the court, how they shaped the law, and you know, important decisions that they really made. Yeah. No, no. Cool. How did you first hear that you were going to be interviewing Justice Thomas? Well, um, I was contacted, you know, about the possibility of, of speaking with him and doing a kind of question and answer session uh, rather than having him come and give a lecture, which he doesn't like to do. And the reason he doesn't like to do is he oftentimes finds himself giving you know, arcane presentations on some narrow uh, interpretation of the Constitution or something that isn't really appealing to a wide range of folks. And he likes to be able to respond to what it is that individuals, you know, might have as concerns or interests, 
that they would like to speak with him about. And he's done this on a number of occasions at other institutions and other universities in which he's gone to places like Harvard or he's gone to Wake Forest or to Duquesne. And he doesn't give a lecture, but instead uh, he makes himself available to talk to people, to respond to questions, to have that free exchange of ideas. He's a very impressive individual. He, um, you know, he is exactly as he portrays himself in his memoir, uh, My Grandfather's Son. So in a certain sense, there weren't a lot of surprises. Um, but, you know, that was good. I mean, the most amazing part actually was not on the, the panel. It was having him in my uh, constitutional law class. Uh, he was just, he, the students loved him. He was really good, good in the, in the class. And he, I think he enjoyed that the most. I think he enjoyed it more than being up on stage. What did he do in the class? In the class, he mainly, um, you know, he, he, fielded, he fielded questions from the students. Um, and, and he dispensed a lot of sort of, um, you know, sort of wisdom that, you know, to, to them uh, to help, uh, you know, to help student people in their, their situation who are still trying to find out, figure out what they're going to do with their lives and who they are and so forth. And the students, I think, really, really enjoyed that. You also, you chose the students who asked the, the questions. Mm -hmm. how, how did you choose that? Uh, I let them submit questions, and, uh, and then I chose from the questions that they asked. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily the best questions. It was the ones that, that you know, ones that didn't overlap, ones that sort of fit, ones, the ones I thought that would be interesting for the audience. Um, there were there were fewer questions than I expected about the Constitution. And yes. What is the motivation behind that? Well, um, I guess you know I, I said before that he's exactly as he is in his memoir, um, and how how he is in his memoir is incredibly straightforward, very humble, um, uh, and he he clearly. Um, you know, what's interesting is is that he clearly has a very well developed approach to constitutional interpretation. Um, but he also clearly doesn't like discussing constitutional theory that much. Um, I think he likes engaging students and talking to them about where they are and, uh, you know, sort of telling them about, um, you know, how to go about living their lives and so forth. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, here, you know, it's funny. A couple of the questions I had on my, on my list were, was, one of them was your colleagues, uh, Justices Scalia and Breyer, have both written books about their approaches to constitutional interpretation. Can we ever expect a, a book from, from you about that? Perhaps my grandfather's constitution as a marketing idea for him. Um, but I realized by the end of the day, after having uh, spent a few hours with him, that there's no, uh, th that I know what the answer to that was going to be. It was going to be no. Uh, in fact, one of, one of my other questions was, uh, can we expect, uh, if you had to write a law review article about a, a pressing issue of constitutional law um, for tomorrow, you know, tomorrow, start the, the law review article, that uh, his answer would be, I wouldn't write an art law review article, and and indeed he hasn't. I don't think he's written one since 1987. Um, I, I think that he, he, you know, part of his persona is that he thinks that the the intellectual chattering classes are um, just have blinders on to the problems of America, and um, he distances himself from from that. And so, you know, I've seen other interviews where he will talk about the Constitution to a certain degree, like he, and, and talk about the founders. And so, both Professor Malek and I were a little surprised when he didn't bite and ramble on as he did. And, and I, I don't mean ramble in a derogatory sense; so that it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, but he didn't talk a lot about um, and run with the question that, that Professor Malek asked about the founders, and the question that I I asked about the role of the Declaration of Independence. Um, in constitutional interpretation, because that's actually one of the things he has written in a law review article on, although it was a law review article in like 1987 or something. Um, so yeah, and then, and then of course both I and Eileen, one of our students, asked him about originalism, and he didn't uh, he didn't bite, he didn't uh, uh, really flesh, elaborate upon that. Um, so I you know I think that he likes talking about uh, his background and sort of his larger views about, um, you know, the importance of, of, and the significance of being on the court, but not really so much about getting into, like, constitutional theory and that sort of thing. So, Svi, you, you mentioned a 1987 law article. Mm -hmm. um, during his nomination process, the, the Supreme Court nominees are, are highly politicized these days. Yes. And he was, nom he was nominated um, in, a, in an interesting way, made an interesting nomination. 
uh, will you elaborate a bit on, on that? <laughs> um, sure. Um, I mean, he was, he was, you know, he attended uh, Yale Law School and then was the, um, the head of the Equal Opportunity, um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, sorry, the EEOC. <laughs> um, and so he was the head of, a, of a, an important, um, you know, uh, agency in the government, executive agency in the government. Um, and then he got appointed to the uh, D.C. Circuit Appellate, Federal Appellate Court, um, from which actually a lot of, more recently, a lot of Supreme Court justices have come from, like uh, just Chief Justice Roberts, for instance. Um, and um, he was only on that court for a year and a half before getting the, the nomination to uh, the Supreme Court. And so, of course, when he was nominated, a lot of people said, oh, um, he doesn't have the experience, um, you know, that the... Uh, the Bush administration, um, you know, wanted to replace Thurgood Marshall with another African American. Although, according to his memoir, they almost they, they tried to avoid doing that, um, but they ended up going with Thomas anyways. I forget what what, what exactly the story was, but um, so um, you know, so he gets nominated, and um, the, you know, there were, there were, there was an issue about whether he had the experience um, and whether he was you know had the qualifications essentially to be a Supreme Court justice. Um, and, um, so he went through the, the nomination process and I think arguably wasn't any more vague in his answers than, than most people have been ever since, uh, you know, uh, Judge Bork, uh, got, got voted down in his confirmation hearings. Um, uh, however, of course, then, um, in the, uh, in the, toward the end and the, uh, issue of Need Hill came up and the allegations that he had sexually harassed her um, when she was working at the EEOC under him. Um, and, you know, the, the debate rages on about who was telling the truth. And, and in the memoir, of course, he categorically denies that, that, uh, that he did what she said and basically sort of um, uh, painted her as a bit of a social climber with an agenda. Um, and also pointed out that she actually had him come out to, I believe it was the University of Oklahoma Law School, where he wrote a recommendation for her to get a job later. Um, and she invited him out to speak. And so he offered that as evidence that he didn't do the things that she said. Um, and, you know, for a while there was, there was you know, a conspiracy theory that, that there were various left-wing operatives who had put her up to it and so forth. Um, on the other side, people, people uh, say that there were a few other women who were going to testify um, to having similar experiences. Um, but they didn't end up testifying. I think it was uh, Senator Biden um, who um, decided not to call them in the end. Uh, maybe there was some deal cutting going on. But in any case, um, his his response to that is, is these were all people who left the EOC frustrated and and, uh, and so forth. So um, again, um, apparently there's a documentary coming out on Anita Hill. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that adds any anything to to what we already know. So. No, you can ask the Abby question. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to keep this thing straight. How's that? Do you want to put it? Yeah, no, list? it works. I'm good. Perfect. Um, we're experimenting on it. Sure. Um, so, uh, basically, every Supreme Court justice has been to an Ivy League. Yes. Yeah. And you, you almost, you went to Duke, which is as, as, as Ivy as it gets in the South. I suppose so. Yeah. It's, it's the, it, 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 Harvard, is, Harvard is the Duke in the North, as we like to say. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on how such an elite group of people from such a small circle, how they can do that, and also on the fact that Justice Cla that Justice Thomas came all the way out here and spoke here. He's obviously interested in that. Well, let, let me correct one thing. I went to, to Duke for my PhD, for my law degree. I went to a more blue-collar school, University of California, Hastings. Uh, of course, it's, I shouldn't call it blue-collar. It's, it's, it's very good, but regional, not, not Ivy League uh, school. But in any case, um, well, you know, Thomas himself uh, has, you know, is very vocal about his views that um, the court lacks diversity because they are all Ivy League trained um, uh, lawyers. Um, how do I feel about it? I, you know, I, I would, I, I think that it would probably be good for the court to get um, some people on there with some legislative experience, um, the way that Sandra Day O'Connor had, uh, even Earl Warren and so forth. Um, now that the the, uh, the pattern seems to be um, a federal appellate judgeship, um, 
uh, probably even even more the DC Circuit, like like uh, uh, Thomas and Roberts and so forth, uh, and, and perhaps even um, you know solicitor generals, both Kagan and Chief Justice Roberts uh, were, were solicitor generals. Um, so there almost seems that there is there is a, a standard, a developing standard profile for Supreme Court justices, and you know um, clearly on, on, in one sense only that the brightest legal minds um, fit that profile. Um, but there is the problem of, of diverse, intellectual diversity and, and, and experiential, I guess, diversity on the court, um, given that these, these people are, going, are deciding issues which do affect you know, the lives of everyday people who didn't go to the Ivy League, who don't or aren't in the legal elite. Um, it might be interesting to have some people who, who have different backgrounds. Um, and you know, Justice Thomas, in, you know, uh, is is interesting on the court because clearly, especially in terms of um, uh, what we consider diverse these days, he has clearly the most diverse background. I mean, obviously he's he's African American, but he also you know grew up in the Jim Crow South, um, impoverished, didn't have you know indoor plumbing. I don't think until he was about eight years old and so forth. Um, I mean, there's no question that he had you know, the authentic Jim Crow African-American experience in Georgia growing up um, and none of the other, uh, you know, all, all of the justices all have their diverse backgrounds, uh, nothing, nothing close to that. Um, and your, your second question was, um, was what? <laughs> Is that was the second part of that question? No. Yeah, I think you, was that you, it? You covered it. Okay. Um, my last question though is, unless you have something. Go for it. My last question is, you, you're, a, you're a lawyer. Mm -hmm by training and you still serve in JAG. Yep. Um, you deal with a lot of judges. You know, or you know. A lot I know of judges. judges. I know, I know if you actually work in the JAG with, with a couple of judges, a, a state okay. appellate court judge and, and at one point two other, uh, actually actually right now, two other um, county judges and, and there was another one that retired a few years ago, but yeah. So can you attribute a certain je ne sais quoi to the, to the supremeness of Justice Thomas? Can you, can you, is there something about him that's different? Yeah, he has U.S. Marshals guarding him. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, actually, it's it's funny. I, you know, he, he uh, it, the um, the uh, um, appellate state judge that I, that I work in the job in, in the uh, National Guard with, um, he's super 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 intellectual. He 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 loves to he loves, likes talking to me to talk political philosophy and so forth. He was telling me about the latest book he read and so forth. Um, and again, you know, one of the things I, that I thought was interesting about um, Justice Thomas is that uh, while he's clearly well-educated and very intellectually curious, um, you know, one gets the feeling that he doesn't, he thinks that, that talking about highfalutin philosophy is, is often a waste of time uh, for someone in his role and for someone who is, is representing real people, right? That's kind of that's his, um, his view, of, view of that, at least that's what I gathered. And you get, like I said, you get that a bit from his um, his memoir too. He he talks about um, times when he's been interested in in political philosophy and so forth. But notice in, in the interview uh, up on stage when I asked him about um, uh, you know, and I, so I said you once called referred to yourself as a, as a part time political theorist, which was going to be my segue into asking him a question about political philosophy. He immediately you know sort of deny well he didn't deny it, but he said. Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. Distanced himself from that comment. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, there was there was that. So, um, I guess what do I want to say about his supremeness? Um, uh, you know, he's he's a very engaging um, person who's also very humble. I mean, he went around to every student uh, after the end of the class and shook all of their hands, asked their names, asked what what they're majoring and so forth. And it was like twenty five students. Um, with the federal marshals, uh, I take it the one they, 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 he had a, a, a detail that was at least partially based here in Portland, so people he'd never met before, and he would walk over to each one and and uh, you know introduce you know so ask them how they were doing, ask them what their names were, and so forth. And of course, Jeffrey Tubin notes that he he does this around the court as well, and in, in his book The Nine. Um, so what do I want to say? Very magna magnanimous. Um, uh, and very humble in his role. I mean, I think I think that that maybe is the um, hallmark of his supremeness uh, for him is being is being humble in in that role. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. I really